Hey everybody, welcome to the 113th episode of Fireside Chats with Run Try Bike, now oh, under dude. the banner of the Everyday Athlete Podcast Network. We just put out a post on Instagram and Facebook and threads about this brand new network that we have recently launched. We have seven shows. Check them out. They're going to be on iHeartRadio, Amazon Music. They are on um, Spotify and Apple Podcasts, as well as on YouTube Music. Today, we have a very special guest, somebody that I interviewed a few months ago. Her name is Chantel Erickson, and the vibe was palpable, so I'm super excited to bring her on. Chantel is an academic. She's a pianist and a self-described nerd, but what do those things have in common besides her? They also are tied into her being a runner, a coach, a business owner, and a published author. So we will find out what she can't do since she's capable of doing all of those things. Um, so let's welcome Chantel to the show and let's get on with it. Hey, Chantel, hey. how are you? I'm awesome. I'm excited to hang out with you guys today. Thank you for having yeah. me. No, thank you for joining us. I told you when we were in the green room how excited I was to have you on our show because of the enjoyment I had while I was interviewing you for the story on our website. So I can't wait to get this going. But before we do, we have an icebreaker question for you. And that uh, Om just left, so he must think that you're going to answer incorrectly. <laughs> <laughs> so our icebreaker question, is, and we've become known for this, is pineapple on pizza, yay or nay? I would say, yay, I like it. Um, I grew up like loving Hawaiian pizza. My daughter loves Hawaiian pizza. And as you know, if you're a parent, you have to bow to your children basically and lay aside anything that, <laughs> that you might like for them. So I'm going to say yay to pineapple. I'm the one who should have ducked out then. I, as a born <laughs> and raised New Yorker, it's blasphemous to hear somebody say that they would put pineapple on pizza. Even if you're your kids, you gotta you gotta teach them a lesson right out of the gate. You can't always get what you want, kid. You know, I should take some parenting tips from you for real. <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> We're waiting for Om to get his camera set up, so I'm gonna jump into this with you. So, during the introduction, I mentioned that you are an academic, a pianist, and a self-described nerd. How does that person end up becoming a runner, an ultra runner, and a coach for running? You know, I honestly, that's a great question because if anyone knew me as like, like kind of junior high, even like, you know, elementary school, junior high, high school, Chantal, their mind is blown that I am in the sport of running. Um, I was like the furthest thing from an athlete growing up. Um, I loved school um, as a first gen Canadian, as any immigrant kind of, you know, kid or child of an immigrant knows your family is, they're driving education into you. They're driving opportunity. They worked really hard to get to, you know, this country. And so for me, I loved school. I, for whatever reason, excelled at it um, at a very young age. And I was, I was in the enrichment program in the fifth grade. They used to pull certain kids out of the classroom and put them in this like course called like the enrichment program. And it, it essentially was a course for like I would look back and say developing entrepreneurs and creatives like you had to sort of come up with a problem in the world and solve it and like looking back it was probably what it would be today considered an entrepreneurial course but I did it in like 1995 um and then my grandmother's dream was to have a granddaughter or a child play the piano so of course that was projected on me <laughs> and um I played piano for 10 years um honestly I hated every moment of it just because it's not, <laughs> but I loved my grandmother dearly that I did it. And she sacrificed so much to like pay for the lessons. Um, so anytime I had a chance, I was, I was with my head in a book. I was writing. I was, I literally remember my childhood with like pens, highlighters, pencils, journals. And then my grandmother had a typewriter and I would just like go like crazy on that typewriter. And then my uncle bought me my first computer in the eighth grade as an graduate as an eighth grade graduating gift. Um, and he was in he was in tech. He was like in electronics and tech. And so he and that was in the 90s when it was just coming out. So he was like nerdy into tech and electronics. And so he like built my computer, like the motherboard and everything. He built it. 
And then I was like doing this on the computer. And so, um, you know, and this is pre Google, pre Yahoo, pre, pre, pre. Um, and I freaking love learning. If I could figure out how to make six figures as an academic, I would, I mean, like, I mean, I guess I could, if I became a professor, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not. Um, In our house, we've got that going on. Uh, Lori is getting her doctorate at Pepperdine so that she can become a professor at a research university. So it's not too late for you to get started on that path either. So you can, it, there, you could do everything it seems. So why not that? And it's still in my back pocket, trust me. <laughs> yeah. By the way, I'm going to interrupt you for a second because you fixed your hat. And when we were in the in the studio before we went live, you were like, man, I got to get a haircut. And I was like, yeah, so do I. And Ohm's like, yeah, so do I. It's fine. So cool. And it's it fine. took me a minute to register the joke, too. Um, By the way, uh, I got attacked by angry New Yorkers who like don't like pineapple on their pizza on the way. And that's why I had technical issues. But <laughs> I missed the question. Did you say yay or nay on pineapple? I said yay to pineapple. Oh, man, I missed my opportunity to ask the question. <laughs> <In> pineapple. <laughs> She has she she has a connection to Hawaii and and for her child uh, was why so I told her you know toughen up the kid tell him you can't always get what you want and move on. They totally own me, my kids. Like it's bad. <laughs> I'm wearing a Taylor Swift sweater because my daughter loves Taylor Swift, and I literally sold my soul to buy her tickets to a Taylor Swift show in Vancouver this December, like literally sold my soul to do it. So it's Let like- Swift, Swift economics is real. Swift economics is real. Swift economics, yeah. I was in, I, we were living in Seattle when she played there and the stadium oh, wow. is about two miles from our apartment and you could hear it. Like wow. you could hear how loud that stadium was from two miles away. That, that, that lady is doing it and she's I doing it and she's doing it well. Believe it or not, where I live in Little Lethbridge, Alberta in Canada, she played a show here and I, I'm like a block from where it was played, my house is. And it was when she was like 14, 15, 16 and a country artist. So she hadn't made it yet and she played here. So I'm like, why couldn't we seen her then when she was like $10? You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> I gotta ask you what might be a sensitive question since you're growing up in Alberta near Calgary, Edmonton is also in Alberta. They just lost the Stanley Cup yesterday. Yeah. Is that a big deal for you? Um, for me personally, no. But for a lot of the people that I love, yes. I <laughs> grew up in Ontario, so like, and I'm not a huge hockey fan. I'm, I married an American, so I naturally became an NFL fan. Um, and I just love football. I also love MLB. Um, but um, yeah, like it's, it's sensitive around here. Let's go with that. My husband's. Uh, what is it? His cousin, his cousin was the CFO of the Calgary Flames for many years, or wow. yeah, whatever he did in the in the finance department there. Um, and so, like, I think the family kind of felt like they had to be Flames fans. But like, where I am in this neck of the woods, it's Oiler flags everywhere. Like, it's just wow. There's two little kids that were riding their bike past my house yesterday after school. And I was like, oh, what's up, buddy? Like, whatever. And we're talking, these two little cute kids. And and he's like, oh, he's like, uh, yeah, I'm so excited to watch the Oilers tonight. My dad's going to let me stay up late and watch the Oilers. I was like, cool. Oh. But yeah. I was like, well, I hope your team wins. He's like, yeah, they have to win tonight. Like, he was so hardcore. He's like six years old. And this is great. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, I love it. I love it. If that is some hardcore, like, energy for a six-year-old, for sure. <laughs> 100%. Yeah. So let me ask you this, your, your, as we were talking in the, in the back studio, we were talking about what you do um, in, in growing your community. You have a community of women, um, moms, who come to rely on you for information. And so my question to you about that is, is being an academic like super helpful in being able to relay information to them in a scientific manner? And is that why they've come to trust you? Um, because not only the scientific side of it and you're bringing facts, but you have a ton of energy and you're, you're lively. And, I, and I'm wondering if, if those are two traits that your community has said to you, hey, Chantel, this is why we're here. 
Yeah, you know, it's super interesting that you mentioned that because like when I was a rookie trainer, the one feedback reel that I heard a ton of was people really liked the education that I was giving them on like why we were doing that exercise. So for me coaching it, I wasn't like, cool, just do your bicep curl, cool, cool. I was like, um, so we're working this muscle group for this reason, or I really think that we need to focus on strengthening your glutes because I think that's going to help your lower back pain. Um, I feel like your hamstrings are really tight. So I feel like there's that that's actually coming from somewhere else in your body. So let's just do some exploratory stuff. So like I've always kind of been like educating as I was instructing fitness or personal training. And that probably comes from my need to know. Like if somebody like throws some random thing at me, I'm like, where's that situated? Like where did where did that land? Like where does that come from? what article or research thing is that planted in? Like, don't just throw me random things. Like, I wanna know what that means. Um, so yeah, I feel like my community really values that. You see, when I was, when I especially like was having, uh, when I had a miscarriage and a, and a delivery and went through the whole postpartum thing, it's so weird to say that in like 2012, we were so behind on women's health. We still are, we still are. And um, it's so crazy because we, we had no, no reference for women. Every A lot of the exercise journals and a lot of the things that are written are studies that are predominantly done on, you know, men. And it's changing a little bit, but not rapidly enough. Um, there's There's been a lot of women coming on the scene now. There's actually a Canadian doctor, Dr. Jen Gunther. She lives in California, but she's Canadian. And she was like the first person to begin writing actual books that are medically based on um, the woman's body. And we just don't see this a ton. If you Google it, it's really hard to find. So yeah, people would come to me and uh, honestly, a lot of the stuff I was learning was like me going to the doctor and advocating for myself and being like, so this and that, but why? Or me pushing buttons in the medical system to try to figure out answers and reasons. Like one of the stupidest things I ever heard in my third pregnancy with my daughter was my doctor told me that um, it was extremely unwise for me to teach exercise pregnant and that cycling, like indoor cycling and spin was, he literally, and I quote said, one of the stupidest forms of exercises, it burns very little calories. And um, he's like, it's a waste of time cardiovascularly. Um, and I thought, what is this rooted in? Like, I'm sitting here with a medical doctor and he's, what is he basing this off Is his personal opinion? I fired him and actually went to midwives and learned a ton from midwifery because they're so immersed into the women's body and like birth and all that stuff. And that's their only thing they study. They're hyper-focused on it. Whereas, you know, sometimes GPs, they study a little bit of everything. So they don't really know a ton about anything. And so I just thought, this is crazy. If I didn't have a background in exercise, if I, this wasn't my first rodeo being pregnant, and he had said that to me. Plus, he said, you're going to gain a ton of weight. You're going to end up gaining 60, 70, 80 pounds. You're going to be out of control in this pregnancy. All things you do not want to hear, especially if you have any like background in body dysmorphia or like if anyone had anything to do with eating like disorders or whatever. Like, my God, I couldn't believe what he was saying to me. It was just it blew my mind. And I was like, what is this rooted in? Nothing. It's subjective. It's your opinion. Do you find it hard to like, especially working with the women you work with, do you find it hard? And I think this also ties back into like the green room and talking about social media and like the internet and the perception of all that. And uh, like how a lot of information is not rooted in fact. And a lot of it is just rooted in like uh, sometimes even just like emotion or just like, because I said so, we're putting it out there. Like, do you find it hard to work through that riffraff and, disseminate that information to the women that you work with? Yeah, I do. And sometimes I feel really self-conscious about it. Um, so one thing as a running coach that I've always learned is you never tell somebody that they should do something or encourage them to do something because that was your experience. That's that's not that's not factually based. Um, it can be hard to help people like unravel their smoke screens or like realize that, okay, like you may have heard that, but you really need to understand if that's truth. So I'm pretty blunt and I'll just say to someone like, I don't personally agree with that. Um, here's a great book to read or look this person up or, um, you know, where did you hear about that? A lot of it's question based, like, where did you hear about that? And you realize it's just coming from a chain of people and not necessarily rooted down into something that's factual and scientific and evidence based. 
um, sending them to someone, you know what, I've got to, I'm going to refer you to this particular uh, practitioner and this person, like I'm not the expert in that field, but why don't you go talk to this person that is and learn a ton about your physiology that way. Um, I personally love when my athletes have a little bit of a, uh, a lineup of people that they can go to, like a physio, a physiotherapist, a osteopath, a chiropractor, like go talk to people that spent seven, eight years, nine years, whatever it is, um, immersing themselves in that culture and you are staying relevant with that culture. And when I don't have time to necessarily stay relevant with that, I'll just pop my girlfriend that's a physio a quick question. Hey, buddy, I'm hearing this. What's your thoughts on that, right? And I get great information and a great feedback from that. So it's very important to stay connected to professionals and not pretend like you are one um, when that's not your industry. So, and okay. and you know, um, I Jason is going to attest to this as well. Um, but we talk about this all the time. Nobody does it alone. Nobody has all the answers. Like, it's good. Like, I think like it's different from women's health, but we've had a conversation before where like people have approached us for different things like website development or software development. We're like, we don't have the answer, but we know somebody that we connected with on LinkedIn that does, and yeah. he's an expert at this. Um, and so it's really great hearing you take that approach where it's like, I don't know, but I think I know somebody who might have the answer or like, this is the proper way. I mean, in all honesty, like ju just to like, put bluntness to it. I think that's how all discussion should be, especially uh, in like listening to each other instead of talking over each other. Jason can definitely attest to that as well. Yeah. One of the things that we get a lot that we see a lot is what's the best way for me to eat? What's the thing I should be drinking, especially in these endurance sports. And we're like, we are not dietitians or nutritionists. Like go talk to Stevie, go talk to Jackie Go talk to Alex. Like those are the people that you should be getting your information from, not from us, because that's not who we are. We're not experts in those in that field. <laughs> Far from it, by the way. And but the, as you were talking, one of the things that struck me was this idea that going back to you being an academic and having an inquisitive mind to do the research, to look things up. How do you combat that part of it where in today's society, a lot of people just take whatever's on the internet, whatever's on social media as fact, and they don't do the research, they don't wanna do the research, they don't have time to do the research, or they feel ashamed that they don't know it. And the reality is we can't know everything about everything. So when you're working, you said you asked them, where did you get this information? How do you then instill that sort of inquisitive mindset into, the women that you're working with or the athletes that you're coaching. Yeah, I feel like it's following up with their journey. And so like, it's not like this is our conversation and that was the end of it. I'll be like, so it's kind of like circling back, right? So it's like, so what did you learn about that? Or I'll say, hey, when you get that information, I would love to learn. I would love to learn with you. So hit me back with that information, right? And so I think um, the follow-up is really important because I think that, uh, I'll be honest with you, there's a lot of things that go on out there people need to go and get good information, then they don't, then stuff happens. And um, and so I think people need accountability uh, and I wanna hold people accountable to themselves to do that and to follow it up. And um, if someone says they're gonna do something, like my biggest strength as a coach, probably the reason why people have hired me for 11 years and enjoy working with me, is I'm just a really good accountability buddy. Um, I, I just, I take, I take everybody like I, I take everybody to my heart, like, you know, like like they're a part of my family. And so like I do care. I will follow up with people. Um, and I've been dropped in the system and I've been hurt and I've been crushed and I've been given bad information. Um, and that's not fun. And so I feel like I want to protect people from that. And and our health can make a turn very quickly. I've seen people be unsupported and seen their health take a turn. And I just think like, we don't have time for that in this society. And unfortunately, because of TikTok, which I'm still not on. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry, I'm kind of proud of not being on TikTok. I gotta tell you, Chantel, like we just went on TikTok like two weeks ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, it, and it's it's not Omar I doing it because we just, there's not enough time in the day. Lori yep. is handling it uh, yeah. and, and like, we, I was so proud to say we're not on TikTok for so long, too. <laughs> so proud. 
I might have to break eventually, but I'm not going to be running my own TikTok show either. I just, yeah, I, I, yeah, you know, and people go and get it from like, you know, someone on their Instagram feed and it's like, whatever, like false information flies, man. Like it flies. And, um, I just think like, we've got to put an end to that. I, yeah. And just even like younger generation kids saying this isn't to stomp on them or anything, but like, it's just so easy to get by today without a proper education. And like, gosh, I remember like footnoting and like having to like go and take my like nine textbooks out and break my back, like carrying them and like search and look and search and look. And I'm so grateful to have grown up in that generation that doesn't just take information at, at face value. I'm always going to challenge it. I I'm a, I'm an Enneagram eight, so I'm just a challenger by trade, but <laughs> are you an eight? I'm dying to know. Yeah. <laughs> that's great. I love that. Um, so yeah, I feel like that's how I, I hold people accountable. So like, let's circle back. Let's, let's see what you learned. And because I want to learn too, when you learn, I learn, when I learn, you learn, it's, it's always a constant, you know, give and take. So how do we help people, um, figure out who the, the information is coming from is reputable mm. it, it, because mm right? It could be, it's hard to discern who's reputable and who's not reputable. One of the things we talked about is vulnerability. And I think that it starts there, right? When we can share our own stories and we can tell people like, this is the shit that I've gone through. And as I was explaining to you, um, I recently lost my mother. I lost my dad when I was 24. Um, I'm 50 years old now. So I've gone more than half my life without a dad in my life. My mother has now passed. I've been divorced twice. I've battled alcohol. I have um, battled disordered eating. And I think when when I'm vulnerable with that stuff and I talk to people about sharing their story, they now trust me because this guy's telling me all of this stuff. So there must be some trustworthiness in there. Is that a way for, for you to break through to some of the, the clientele that is hiring you is by being vulnerable and sharing your story as well? hundred percent. I think vulnerability is 100% the way to build a community and the way to build a real friendship with somebody. I I've often sat back and analyzed my friendships with people. And I have learned that I'm just not a surface girl. I don't do small talk. We're either going deeper. We're not going at all. Like that's just who I am. And so vulnerability is huge. And I know in sharing, when I had my miscarriage, even in my delivery, there was like an 80 year old lady that like I was friends with. I just knew her through the grapevine. And she actually phoned me and she goes, I've never told anyone this my whole life. And she was 80. And she was like, I had a miscarriage. My daughter's name was Kathy. Back then we never talked about it. And I was like, oh my God, like this 80 year old lady is disclosing to me that she lost a child at some point. And she's held that inside her entire life. Like, I think mental health is a big piece there too. Um, I can hear, like when I talk to my athletes, because I've, been in running for 19 years um, because I I grew up in a family where there's some mental health stuff and, and whatnot. And um, I can sort of pick up on that wavelength a little bit. And I try to make that conversation very comfortable for people. I talk about my stuff that I've learned in counseling because I feel like some people won't go to counseling. So like if I can share something that I took away that really worked and helped me, I'm going to share that tool that my counselor gave me in my toolkit. For someone else because they may not go but maybe they will if i share that this i got this cool tool from that so vulnerability is key and in the sport of running i feel like everybody's bringing all of their things that they're going through and sort of um it's channeling into the sport of running it's a way for them to process it so what a better time than to be vulnerable and let your guard down a bit because I guarantee you that that person you're running beside or that person you meet at a race or that person you pace with for a few moments in a race, if you let your, if you even just have a very sort of like open presence to you, we're, it's not surprising that people feel comfortable to share something. They're almost, people are almost looking and waiting for someone to create an opportunity for them. And like, I think of how open some of my friends are about their body dysmorphia women need that men need that too and i just think gosh it just makes you feel normal and it it just takes away the judgment in society so i think vulnerability is like the ticket to the world being a better place and 
to information getting to where it needs to go. 100%. And, and one of the things that I have found is when you're on a, a run, especially a long run, and you're stripped bare, right? You're hungry, you're tired, you're thirsty, you're trying to, to solve the problems in those scenarios, and you look to somebody for help. And in that moment, when they provide you help, there's a connection. And then all of a sudden, the, the conversation starts to flow. And mm -hmm. before you know it, there's a camaraderie. And sometimes those moments last 30 seconds to a minute, might be at an aid station. And then there are other times when you're running with that person for miles on end, and now you're sharing things. And then all of a sudden you're like, hey, I want to connect with this person, you know, online. And you and you start to learn more about them. And I think that's where, um, for me, running and endurance sports in general becomes like this conduit to um, enjoyment and fulfillment in life. Yeah. Whereas in other moments, it could be really detrimental, right? The, the comparison game. Yeah. You see somebody's highlight reel and they're running a seven minute mile and you're like, man, I'm struggling for nine and a half or they're running 200 miles and you're like, man, I can't even get around the block these days. Mm -hmm. How do you process and how do you avoid the comparison game when it comes to your running when you're out there? That is such a great question. I think um, I've had to go through a maturity process with that. Um, I feel like younger Chantal was so new to the sport that I didn't really know how I would compare myself to somebody because like I was just new on the scene. Once you get into it, um, just like they say, like the top five people that you spend the most time with, they're going to really influence your world. I kind of started getting some vibes that weren't healthy for my mental health with some certain people that I I'd say our friendship was for a season or a reason and for a season. I think the hardest thing was letting those people just kind of naturally fade out of my world because I was beginning to get into my head and become someone that I really wasn't and almost pushing to levels that I actually didn't want to push to because that didn't suit who I was, but I was getting caught up in that. Or like if you get a trigger, you know, and like you see something on Instagram and when you start putting yourself down because the person that I'm really not for that. So there was a mature Chantal that was like, and hide story or hide. I'm not ashamed to say that it was just like, cause I have had trauma in my life that I let those triggers constantly come up for me. And then I guess probably with counseling and the empowerment of that, I was like, why am I doing that? Why do I allow triggers? If I see something that's triggering me, we just quiet that trigger. It doesn't, I don't have to choose it. And so, and now mature Chantal sees, you know, things that I'm just so proud of people because that's their story and whatever mission they're on. Great for them. I also see some people doing some things and I'm going, they need some healing in a certain area of their life. And until they find that maturity themselves. Okay. I have no judgment for them, but I'm, I care. So I'm gonna watch them and, you know, and congratulate them, but maybe just be over here in the corner and just like being concerned and putting that energy out for them, you know. And so maturity as an adult, going through hard times, realizing that you're not superwoman or superman and you can't have this trajectory of becoming better, 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 better. You're going to fall. You're going to have seasons that are shit. It's all part of it. And so I don't know, mature maturity just... You just get happy for people. You're over there. I'm over here. I'm happy over here. Sometimes I need to be pushed. I'm getting a little comfortable. So now I need that person's energy to push me out of my comfort zone. Okay. <laughs> you know, you know it's, I'm cracking up because uh, I was, I've been two or three weeks behind on master chef generations. And so <laughs> they had Gen Z on, uh, I guess three weeks ago and I watched it and I'm thinking to myself like, yeah, at one point, right. I'm a Gen Xer. I was, I was their age and I didn't listen to my elders. And I was like, I'll figure it out. Screw you. I know better. Right. Like, why is it that when we're young, we're dismissive of the elder generations that have so much to give us. And now I'm 50 years old. And now I, I love teaching at the college level. I get to teach 18 to 22 year olds and I have a blast doing it love that. because I want to impart my wisdom on them. And they're there to absorb the knowledge. Right. But why, why are we so dismissive when we're their age? Like, shut up, old man. I'll take care of it myself. God, I wish someone could explain that to me. <laughs> Apology courses of the adolescent brain. <laughs> it doesn't. Uh, 
brain isn't really coming to for a while and it takes a little longer for boys. I always joke with my husband, I think you actually matured when you turned 40. <laughs> 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 but yeah, you know, and like, it's crazy. I just feel like all the wisdom that I wish I would have listened to. My grandmother's pretty much never been wrong. And like, even when I was in the height of my fitness instructing career, teaching 18 classes a week, five spin classes and the rest strength and, you know, coming home just totally zonked. My iron levels are shot, everything. Just wait, she'd say like, you look like you're wasting away. She's like, you know, if you ever get sick, you got nothing on that body to hold you together. And she's like, you're gonna kill yourself. Like, and I was like, oh, okay, Nana, you know? And then one day I woke up and I was like, I'm going to kill myself. And it, it took me going to the doctor going like, your iron isn't just like not, it's like, it's not low. It's non-existent. Like th this can't go on. You're having cardiovascular issues now. Um, and it's like, my grandmother told me this seven years ago, eight years ago, but I wasn't willing to listen to my elders. So now that I'm older, it's like the first person I want to ask is Nana. It's like, what does Nana think? Like, <laughs> you know, and it's crazy. Cause it's like, we'll call my husband's parents. Like we're 40 years old, my husband and I. I'm 39. I'm dating myself a little bit here, but you know, and it's like, you want to call your parents and run it by them. Like, Hey guys, we're about to do this financial decision. What do you guys think about that? Great. Whatever you guys think y'all are grown up now. <laughs> you, need to tell me you don't go to, to the internet and find the guy who's got seven hacks to success and follow his plan. I'm, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> Best stories for the ones where your parents are like, you know, I wish I had done this. It's like, I'm going to do what they wish they had done. I'm going to fix that problem. Cause like, that's how I want my kids to be. Right. It's like, all they're going to hear from me is, is like, Hey kids, you know, and poor, my poor kids. Cause like, I'm that mom. When my son gets a job, I'll be taking 25% out to stick it in an investment for him. It's like, let's take that. It's just like, you know, like he's going to hate me because I'm just going to be covering over his future for him and making sure he's never going to miss a beat. But I would have killed for that. You know, At like 18 or 20, he'd be, he's going to be thrilled that you've done that. <laughs> trust me. I hope so. <laughs> so. You talked about like mute and scrolling by and saving your mental uh, health and your mental peace. Do you still play the piano? And does that help you do that too? I don't. I wish I could say somebody just asked me the other day, like, can you still play? And it's like, you know what? I can read music really well. And if I took lessons today as an adult, I'd pick it up really quick. Once you do 10 years of piano as a child, it's like learning to ride a bike. It's just kind of there. It has lied dormant for so many years. And so, no, I definitely don't play the piano. I can honestly say it's on my retirement list. So I'm never really going to retire, but like my retirement's going to be like, cool, I'm going back to school to get another you know, whatever, I'm going to go back to school again, or I'm going to pick up this instrument or learn this language. Like I have a thousand things I'd love to do when I have spare time, if that ever is, but no, I don't. And I, I regret it. I'm, I do. I, I, again, it was one of those things. I do think that it made me a really good student though, because piano, they say to music in general, just, it just, I don't know. I don't, I'm not, I don't, I should go do my research before I say anything, but the <laughs> the science behind it, it does, it has an impact on the brain and your ability to learn and study and memorization. And, and so I, I do think that that it left a positive imprint on me that way. And I, I really wish I could, I wish I could say to you today that I play and I don't. Is so does running um, become sort of that? I, I don't like it when people say running is therapy because they're not, those are two separate things. But mm -hmm. when you, when you run, is there a therapeutic component to it that gets you away from the world for even just a moment, 30 minutes, an hour, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, I, I think a hundred percent and music does that too. And I think as a little girl, when I was like learning how to play, you know, when you get that, when you hit that wrong note, it's like, Oh, it just like strikes you in a really odd way. But then when you, you know, get your fingers are going on the piano and you're, and you're hitting all the right notes and you've got the right tempo. Um, it almost has like, it gives you a feeling in your body. It's so funny because music is it's such a calming tool um and i think running gives me that same feeling that the piano gave me um when i was little and i actually haven't really said this out loud because i've never had time to think about it i do really think that looking back the piano probably because i wasn't an athlete probably really helped me 
go through what I was going through with my childhood, um, you know, kind of situation of what I was growing, growing up in a broken home, probably helped me process that and get through that. I've never really verbalized that, but, and then I think I kind of found running and then that was my next version of it. Um, so yeah, I, I think a hundred percent music in general is so good. I love music. I don't listen to a ton of it when I run. Um, but I think music is very therapeutic for sure. For those of you that are just joining, you can get a lot of the backstory on Chantel on our website at runtrymag.com. Search for Uncovering the Strength Within and Chantel's story will show up there um, since we've had the chance to interview her previously and, and get the written word out. So it's awesome to have now the, the audio visual component to your story. Um, you started running in 2012 and this will be our last question before we jump into the rapid fire piece. So you've been running for 12 years at this point, give or take. What has been some of the highest highs you've experienced through running? And what has been maybe one of the lowest lows you've experienced through running? Yeah, and I actually um, started running when I was, uh, it would have been in 2004 or five. 2012 was when I trained for my first, um, was that my first full marathon? But 2012 was kind of like the year that I had a second pregnancy and lost that pregnancy and, and what went to running, but I've been running for 19 years. Um, highest high and lowest lows. Whew. That is a great question. You know, yeah, this last weekend I ran a race, um, in what's called the crow's nest pass in Alberta here. And it's the Minotaur sky sky runner series. And it's known as Canada's hardest 10 K and I actually think I had a moment of one of the highest highs in this race this last weekend. Um, it's just the first thing that's coming to mind when you ask me that. And that was, I was uh, doing around, I think it was around 750 to 1,000 meters of elevation gain in five kilometers and um, grappling for rock. And it was just straight vert. And I just remember, like, I felt so in control in my heart rate. Like, my endurance just felt almost robotic. Like... And it was just like, I had a moment on top of the mountain when I looked over my shoulder and can see this beautiful mountain range behind me where I was like, wow, all these years of committing to this sport, here I am climbing a mountain. And it, for lack of a better term, felt effortless. And I was like, I, I live for moments like that where every day you get up and you do that training run and every time you don't want to put on your frigging clothes and go for a run in the cold or you know, I don't know. It's just like, or you skipped a run and you're beating yourself up about it, even though you shouldn't, um, or whatever it is. I had the moment where I was like, I feel freaking proud of myself. Like I'm 39 years old. I accidentally found running. It found me and my God, like who would ever think that I'm on top of this mountain right now doing this. And it feels kind of effortless. I'm not going to say easy, but effortless. Like it feels mechanical because I've been here before, not here, here, but the hard things that I've gone through in life. And I loved what you said to me when we did our other interview together. And you said, you captured it and you said, um, running's not hard, life is. And I net, that is a takeaway that I will hold forever in my soul that you said. And that is 100% true. Life is hard, endurance sport, it feels hard in the moment, but that's not the hard. That's right. Yeah. Exactly right. That yeah. So you, you mentioned Crow's Nest Pass, and I was like, where did I hear that before? Where did I hear that before? And so on Friday of last week, Adam, our good friend who introduced us from Community Trail Running, mentioned Crow's Nest Pass. And I was like, man, that's where I heard that from. So I, I, don't, I know he was doing the Grouse Grind Challenge or something to that effect. Um, I'm presuming that's not the same place you were, though. Um, you cut out there. So what did you say? Something Challenge. He said he said he did the grouse grind challenge. Oh, he did the grouse. Yeah, that's not exactly where I was, but right okay. in similar vicinity. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, it is a really cool little place. If you ever make it to Alberta one day, which I hope you will, because like we have the Rocky Mountains and it's just a really great place for running and cycling, a big cycling province as well. Try a big tri province. But um yeah. Before you go on, yes, yeah. America, the Rocky Mountains do extend beyond the border of the United States. <laughs> they do. America's great, but we have some cool things in Canada too, okay? <laughs> yes, you and Adam to begin with. <laughs> oh, that's so sweet. So funny. Yeah, I know. I know. I love America. I married an American. 
So some of my Canadian friends are like, you do? It's like, yeah, I do. I married an American. He bleeds the U.S. flag, but he he's more Canadian now, I guess, than he is American. He's lived here longer. But yeah, um, the Crow's Nest Pass is, it's just a really special place. It's just rugged and it's not touristy um, whatsoever at all, like Banff is and Jasper. And like, I was like, I finished the race and I sat down in a chair next to some chick and we were talking and I was like, where are you from? She's like, Colorado. And I was like, what? And she's like, yeah, Colorado. I'm like, that's super dope. You came to the Crow's Nest Pass. She's like, yeah, I, I've always heard about this race and she's a schemo racer. And she's like, yeah, I, I do schemo. But like, so I was like, can I get your Instagram handle? I just need to know you. And like, she's a super dope chick from, um, from Boulder, Colorado. But she just came out because she like heard about this race. She heard it was hard. She said that was super hard today. Like she did the 33K. I did the mini. I did the 10. Um, and, you know, it's just like, I feel like that was such a moment of uh, like, I've kind of like, I feel like I've arrived in running where it's not necessarily about how fast I went or what my finish time was. It's like, dude, I feel good when I'm doing this. I feel freaking great. And like, not to mention the views amazing right now. It was just kind of one of those moments. So lows, injuries are tough, man. Yeah. So like, and I got an athlete in an injury right now and my heart's breaking. Cause like I can feel their heaviness and like, um, they made some choices that I didn't really agree with, but at the end of the day, my athletes are going to make their other, their big kids. They can make their own choice. I'll give them my coach's opinion. Their physio will say what their physio is going to say. And then they're going to go do what they're going to decide to do. We're paying the price for that now on the other side of a 60 K ultra marathon that they placed fourth in their age category and for their very first ultra. So not bad, but we put price on the other side. Okay. And so injuries, I've had a couple injuries and man, when you, when you need running as a mental health component, it's just part of your toolkit Yeah. or cycling or although we can usually cycle with an injury for most part, cycling is beautiful. Swimming, swimming is even better. We can usually somehow keep that up, but um, injuries, those yeah. would be my lows because like it's out of your control. You can't yeah. like. It's hard because you also start to see the world moving, right? Mm -hmm. And the world is constantly moving. And when you're moving with it, it's not a problem. But when you're injured and you're seeing people, it's hard to hit that mute button or that hide button or not pay attention and, and want to be out there as well. As a matter of fact, earlier today, I ran and it was hard. It was a 30 minute run. It was hard because I had just paced Ohm at the Tahoe 200 for 50 miles and I'm clearly not recovered, right? No. My mind was like, you could go for a 30 minute run. You're good. I got like 10 minutes, 12 minutes into this run. I was like, I need to walk. I'm clearly not there yet. And that's just recovery from an event. If you're injured, it may be six, eight weeks. And that can be really hard on the mind to think, okay, the world is moving by to not compare yourself. So absolutely injuries are going to be the thing that gets people down. But here's what I want to say to that. Not every injury is terminal. You mm -hmm. will get through it. You will make your way through it. You will talk to a coach, talk to a doctor, figure out other ways to be active that don't impact the injury and then you won't feel that that sort of burden of missing out. Would you no, agree I, with that? And one of my biggest tips with an injury is like, I personally only work with practitioners who are athletes in their background as well. So my physio is an athlete, you know, was and is, my osteo is, my chiro. And I just feel like that's just, it feels like a great support system when they understand that you want to get back to your sport but they also want you to be in the best possible condition to get back to your sport. And they're thinking about long-term you, not short-term you. Um, but I think, yeah, supporting people that have an injury and just knowing that like the injuries, there's so many ways around it. You can cross train, you can get on the bike, you can focus on your strength training, non-load bearing. You can do so many things. It's not like the end of the road. Um, and sometimes it's exploratory. It's like, Hey, I can't run. So I guess I'm going to do yoga now because I can do that. And that might open up an avenue of you that you never knew. And that's probably going to make your sport even better down the line. Everything is positive to me. So like when yeah. it happens, it's like, I have to see the flip side of this. Like the glass has to be half full. I'm in a stage of life now where I'm done with the BS. So like the glass is just always half full. Even if there's a person that drives me nuts and I don't really want them in my life anymore or whatever. It's like, 
that person's teaching me something. That person's making me more patient. That person's doing something. The glass is half full. I'm sure experience. It has to be. So injuries, glass half full, you know? This is why you and I vibe, even though we disagree on pineapple on pizza. Like <laughs> a lot of our a lot of our mentality is is in alignment with each other. Like I'm an uber positive person too. Um, I want to root for you. I want to cheer you on because I also know, right, we can get into our own head and get into the doldrums and life gets hard, like we mentioned earlier. But if you got somebody who's on your side rooting for you, even if it's a complete stranger, yeah, it'll change. It'll make you feel better about yourself. Like I ran about two or three weeks ago and I was at a stoplight and this dude rolls up on me and he's like, oh, how far are you running today? I was like, yeah, about 35 minutes. I'm almost done. He's like, yeah, I just came back from a scene of my own accident. And I'm like, oh, what happened? And wow. he, he face planted um, riding his longboard, he said. Wow. And so we started talking about longboarding and cycling and running and the light changed. And he's like, all right, I'll see you later. And I was like, no, dude, we're in the middle of a conversation. I'll walk across the street with you because I want to hear more about this. And, you know, when we finished the conversation, he's like, thank you for your time. And like that meant the world to me. I have no idea what his name is. I don't know if I'll ever see him again. But in that moment, we were able to support each other. And it was like strangers cheering for each other to, to take that next step. And I think that's super vital um, for all of us as humans to, to continue to want to progress. And if you can lend that positivity to somebody else for a moment, man, you might change their entire world. So totally. And people are watching us. I'm like, for whatever reason, runners are very inspirational. And, you know, they say 1% of the world will run a marathon. Like that's a pretty big deal. Like that statistics crazy, right? Like maybe it's 2% by now. Cause a lot of people picked it up in COVID, but, um, you know, I just think like pause and like those people are going to pop up in your life. And, you know, similarly, I was, I was volunteering at my daughter's field trip the other day, we're at the big outdoor pool with the water slides and two girls, teachers are sitting on the chairs beside me. And, and yeah, I just, oh, hello. Like, I'm just kind of saying hello to them. And I don't even know how we got on the topic, but uh, we talked about exercise and, oh, I came from the crow's nest pass race. And so my quads are spent and I was walking like I had a pickle up my butt. Basically, it was just terrible. My quads, I can't even bend my leg. And so I said, apologize for the way that I'm walking. I, I barely made it to this field trip. I had to walk these grade threes to a field trip like a mile. And it was a struggle just to walk there. And, and so they're like, one girl goes, yeah, I know you. I follow you on Instagram. I'm like, you do? She's like, yeah, you're friends with my friend. And I see my friend put up a post sometimes in the middle of winter. You guys go running and you can see your eyelashes all frozen. And she's like, you guys are hella inspirational. Like I see your stuff up there. And like, I'm like, that's so crazy. I'm like, and so like, I hear I was, I had this random connection with this person who's been following me because she's so inspired by the winter running that I do with my friend. Like, you know, you just never know. And then that led to another conversation. And then that led to another conversation. And it's just, it's cool. I love it. Chantel, I could talk to you all day, every day. I, but I want to be respectful of your time. And we need to get into our rapid fire questions, which like I told you earlier, is 100% about food because I love food. Me so too. are you ready? Before we go to the rapid fire questions, though, where can people find you? Where can they get in touch with you? Who are the people you're looking to work with with your business? I love that question. So you can find me at, on Instagram at, at runningmama85. Mama's M-A-M-A -A 85. Um, and then I have a website, bewellchantel.com. You can find me there. Um, and then there's links there to my run coaching because I'm, I'm featured on the personalpeak.ca uh, website as a run coach. Um, but basically bewellchantel.com. Um, you'll be able to sort of see all the different places that I hang my hat and whatnot. So yeah, and I love new friends on on social. So please, like, um, I really love expanding my running network and my endurance athlete friends. I, I, I'm on a mission to have more endurance athlete friends. So. Awesome. You heard it here. Go, go to be well, Chantel. And that is spelled C H A N T E L L E. For those of you who are listening to this and can't see her name spelled on the screen. All right. We already started with pineapple on pizza, which you got wrong. I will say that. Right. Right. <laughs> Aren't you now? Isn't your? Aren't you gonna eat like you know vegan pizza and like stuff on the West Coast? <laughs> I look when it comes to pizza. I know I'm. I eat a plant based diet, which is ninety nine percent vegan. But yeah. I'm a New Yorker, and pizza is dough, sauce, cheese. That's it. Like <laughs> you want 
pepperoni on it, cool. You want to put spinach and mushrooms on it, cool. But once you start putting what I would call exotic things on there, just stop. All just right. stop. Can we put artichoke on it? Is that too exotic for you? Yeah, that- yeah, you could get away with that. That's not bad. Okay. Like when I lived in Seattle, I used to go to this joint called Bambino's. I went there so frequently, Chantel, that I would order it on my phone and I'd walk in there. They wouldn't even ask me my name. They wouldn't <laughs> ask me my order. They would just hand me the box. And it was right, right collab- on my Yeah, post- it's called Bambino's. Bambino's, okay. <laughs> <laughs> in Seattle. And they, the pizza I got was Calabrian peppers, mushrooms, mm-hmm. uh, and I would always add extra garlic to it and um, uh, and olives. But it wasn't a red sauce pizza. It was a white pizza. So Oh, sounds super good. I could. So, be, I love I, lo- I, I could do it if I had if I had to, I could. Maybe I will. <laughs> all right. So here we go. Do you eat Oreos? No, I don't like them. <laughs> well, that answers the question. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's so you might be the, I can't recall anybody else. This is the 113th episode we've done. And some people are like, yeah, I could get away with them. But I've, we've, I don't think we've had somebody just come straight out and say, no. I don't like them. <laughs> no. What about licorice? Are you a fan of licorice? Think, yeah. yeah. Red or black? Red, absolutely not black. <laughs> Twizzlers or red vines? Red vines. American. Do you use, oh, wait. <laughs> do you use it as a straw? No. Ah, uh, we got to we got to teach that. So we got to teach you that. So then you can teach your kid to use the the licorice as a straw. Right, because they need that. <laughs> Look, I I already told the kid he can't have pineapple on pizza. Might as well give him something to 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 use. <laughs> right on. Candy corn. Is candy corn a real candy or is it earwax covered in sugar? Earwax, 100% covered and never understood candy corn. Sorry, bro. <laughs> never. I don't care for it either. The people that give that out at Halloween are pure evil. In my <laughs> <laughs> I always wonder, like, how is Brock still in business? Like, who's buying this stuff that they are still able to produce this after like That's 70 so years? Nasty, dude. Like, <laughs> no. Peeps. Are peeps a real candy or a peeps just are those like the little birds yes i've never had it good for you <laughs> yeah. i've never had a peep <laughs> i i don't like them we've been told in the past that you should let them go stale and good. then eat them and i'm like so let me get this straight you want me to eat something that tastes like shit and make it worse and somehow it's gonna taste better <laughs> I picture them being really hard and like, I don't know. <laughs> creamy or crunchy peanut butter? Oh, creamy. Is a hot dog a sandwich or a taco? Neither. <laughs> um, a taco. A taco. You Most people say sandwich because the, the bun is more like a bread. Right. And I'm just thinking like a taco's long. So I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> red velvet cake is red velvet cake a real flavor or is it just chocolate cake dressed up to go to the prom i think that stuff is also nasty <laughs> it's definitely chocolate cake <laughs> dressed up to go to the prom and to the, no with red velvet <laughs> chocolate cake at 2.99 red velvet cake at 7.99 you're like why did i pay five dollars for the red it's food dye too bougie and it's not worth it it's fake bougie. <laughs> you have a favorite flavor or, or type of cake? Um, I love vanilla and carrot cake, but I'm half Italian, so tiramisu. <laughs> there you go. So are you so then are you a fan of coffee as well? Espresso? Oh, 100%. 100%. Yes. Yeah. Always. Love it. Can't love go wrong. It. Nope. There's a guy who we've featured on our site and he's on threads. He's also on Instagram, Victor Lobato. But the dude loves espresso. He's Brazilian. And mm-hmm. like every day there's a picture of a, an espresso or some form of coffee, Americano or something that has got it in there. So it, when, you, when you're when you ordering coffee, what are you ordering? I love to order an Americano. Sometimes I get a splash of cream in it or whatever. Um, I'm like, I'm a pretty just like Java girl. So I'll just drink straight coffee. I like blonde roast. Um, I grind my beans fresh every morning. Um, if I'm going to have a latte, it's usually just like a straight up latte. If I had to pick a flavor, it'd be hazelnut, but yeah. Awesome. What's your uh, go-to recovery food after either a hard workout or a race? 
breakfast. So <laughs> and what does that consist of? Like if I'm gonna go have something after a race or yeah, like a hard long run, like hash browns and and I like eggs. I'm a big egg girl. So hash browns and eggs kind of a thing. Um yeah, breakfast a hundred percent. Like just give me I'm thinking about like brunch the entire time and coffee and brunch the entire time I'm running. <laughs> are you taking the eggs and hash browns and rolling them in a burrito or are you going on the plate? knife and fork either i'll do it either way i just yeah either way i love them both ways i'm a huge burrito fan because it just makes yep. life easier i can walk around with the damn thing <laughs> yes I, I thank you i swear we were like meant to be like buddies because yes three times this week i made some kind of burrito and was walking around on the go with it <laughs> yeah so you could ask anybody there's two things in life that i love just when it comes to food more than anything else and that's walk around bread and walk around pizza. Again, I'm a New Yorker. And so I would go into a bakery and buy a loaf of bread and literally just walk around Manhattan <laughs> eating the bread, ripping off hunks. Tear the baguette off and is there not? Exactly. <laughs> and then when you go to a, a, I call them pizza closets, there's like, like a pizza joint and there's nothing in there but the oven. You get the slice, you put the paper plate underneath it and you walk around Manhattan while you're eating pizza. So, so American, we don't see that in Canada. I'm telling you like, the whole like, yeah, like that's super American, by the way. Like we don't, we have like, I don't know. It's like we have too much class in certain areas up here. It's like, <laughs> I don't mean to demean you when I say that, but like it is, it's like we have too much class. Like I was in Philadelphia once even and the Chinese food comes in that like box thing, you know, yeah. people are doing this. I'm, you don't, we don't do that here. Like that's not a thing. So, so Chinese takeout or carry out, you're putting it on a plate? Yeah, dude. Like, there's no like, yeah. No, yeah. you gotta. It, it comes in a bar. It comes in an instrument already. You just eat no. it like that. So uncommon here. Like, <laughs> straight, at least where I've lived. So. Yeah. What's your favorite flavor of ice cream? Oh God, that one's tough. I usually gravitate towards things that have peanut butter in them. Um, so like moose tracks, that kind of stuff. But like, I love local ice cream shops that do weird things, like. Earl Grey tea ice cream is one I love. Girl Guides mint cookies ice cream. Um, coffee ice cream. But yeah, I would say anything that has like a nut or a chunk in it, like something like has to be stuck in it. Um, pistachio ice cream. Like, yeah, I'm weird. I like, I don't like, I like weird things in my ice cream. <laughs> no, that's not weird at all. Is, is uh, Earl Grey ice cream, Do you have you ever had a London Fog? Yes. Yeah, so is Earl Grey ice cream similar to that? Yeah, it's basically like London Fog and an ice cream. Yep. Oh, I'm all over it. Like uh, Lori introduced me to London Fogs like four or five months ago. I love and them. almost every other day, my after instead of getting an afternoon coffee sometimes, yep. I'm like London yeah. Fog. I make Phenomenal. those. I love them so much. Yeah. Uh, what's your favorite candy bar? <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. I, there's a lot I like. Um, probably like an O. Henry, but a pretty close second. Do you have score in America or is that just the Canadian? Yes, no, we have that. Yeah. Sorry. My ignorance. Um, score or like an O. Henry, I would say. The one thing we don't have that Adam introduced me to is the Nanaimo bar. I had yeah. never heard of it. And he introduced okay. me to that. Yeah. They're okay. I don't like crave a Nanaimo bar, but like, yeah, they're, so you either love them or you probably hate them, Nanaimo bars. Have you had one? No, I haven't had I had to I had to Google it after he introduced <laughs> it to me. I was like, what the hell is that, dude? <laughs> I love that. I'd much rather eat a butter tart than a Nanaimo bar, though, straight up. What's up. that? A butter tart? You don't know what that is? No. It's, it's like a little, it looks like a mini pie. And so it's like a pie crust that's yummy and got a ton of butter in it. And then it's like, it's probably corn syrup that makes it up and... It's got like pecans in it and I don't know. I don't even know how to describe it. It's like gooey, but in a pie shell. <laughs> awesome. Well, when I make it to Crow's Nest Pass, we'll have to put those in our vests and make the hike and, and get the view. 100%. With those. You go to the cinnamon bun. Cinnamon, what is it called? Cinnamon Bear is a little bakery right in the Crow's Nest Pass. It's got, it'll hook you up with all those things. <laughs> awesome. Last question for you. Trey of Brownies just comes out of the oven. Chantel is going to which part of it? The edge to get a little bit of a crust on there or straight to the middle for the ooey gooey part? 
1000% the edge. Give me the crunch. Give me that little slightly burnt section. I need a crunch. <laughs> do you put nuts on your brownies? No. No nuts? Do you use no. ice cream? Do you put ice cream on your brownies? Yes, that's where I thought the question was going. Whipped cream or ice cream? Ice cream, 100%. What flavor of ice cream? Straight up. <laughs> okay, so now I'm going to introduce you and blow your mind. The <laughs> next time you have brownies, okay. take a piece, put it in a coffee mug, hmm. put coffee on top of that coffee ice cream. <laughs> And as you're eating your coffee, ice cream, and brownie, it'll start to melt and it'll create like an affogato mocha. That and sounds on freaking real right now and I'm salivating right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's undefeated. It is undefeated in the dessert category. Cannot go wrong. Even it's just brilliant. Like there's just something about that. <laughs> Chantel, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. You are an unbelievable conversationalist and, and super inspiring and motivating. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. It's just fun to, it's fun to have you as a friend. So absolutely. We'll see you around. Cheers. Peace. Bye.